everyone. Uh, thanks for tuning into today's webinar, another one in the series of Vibrates educational segments where we try our best to share industry insight to help artists, uh, labels, event organizers, festivals, and of course other music professionals further their careers. Today we'll, we'll look at the music trends for 2022 and how you can apply them to create a winning music marketing strategy. With us are David Boyle, a seasoned expert in breaking down trends for the electronic music industry as a part of IMS Business Report. He's also a founder at Audience Strategies, putting data to work on a daily basis. David, hi. Hey, Joining us is Alexandre Perrin, uh, a professor of music business at Berklee College of Music, who's bringing, uh, bringing business mentality to the traditionally well, creative music industry. He's trained professionals working in the fields, with all fields of the industry, from Spotify to YouTube, major labels, talent agencies, and etc. Alex, welcome, nice to have you with us. Uh, and here we also have uh, Vibrate's own managing uh, editor, Urshka Yaksha, who's the author of Vibrate's annual State of Music report which summarizes the trends of 2022. Well, uh, before we start the discussion, I want you to know that there will be a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Write your question, uh, questions into Q&A box, and of course, we'll take time at the end to answer those. For any quick info during the webinar, to, uh, turn to our two panelists in the chat window. Well, Urshka, let's kick it off with you. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you at Vibrate decide to create this, uh, the, the annual State of Music report? Well, um, as a music data company, we kind of follow every relevant social media and music channel. Right. And this means that music professionals can uh, use Vibrate to look into their fan bases, to see how well their promotion campaigns are working, and a lot of nice stuff. But it also allows us to kind of make an overview, a wider overview of the market and see where the industry at large is going. And this is kind of what we were uh, going for with this report. We wanted to uh, give a macro overview of the market to kind of help everybody who's just kickstarting their planning for 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, David, you're a veteran when it comes to translating trends to music opportunities. Have you noticed uh, more enthusiasm in creating strategies based on data lately? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think with the pandemic has thrown everything up in the air, people now realize what they don't know about the trends that are happening and about the way people are consuming music. Uh, so that's forced everybody to look to data. Whereas in the old world, they thought they had a good enough view about what was going on. They thought they could often get by without data or it was maybe like marginally helpful. But no, absolutely, everybody is saying, show me the data. Like, I feel uncertain, show me the data. Mm -hmm. um, Alex, uh, building marketing strategies might, well, not be something a person has in mind when deciding to start making music or, of course, working in the industry. Does looking at musicians... Uh, as brands make this uh, planning or, of course, reaching goals easier? It does. Uh, I keep saying to uh, the people I'm working with, my students um, who are professional musicians, uh, that they are a brand and they are entrepreneurs. And I think when you, when you bring these two things together, the fact that you're an entrepreneur, but you have also a brand, you need to develop an identity. You need to have a set of goals and you need to reach some objectives. And so that's why I, I think an important part of, of the job of a musician, or at least in the team that is working with a musician, like the manager, for example, has to understand the audience of the musician, the territories of the musician, mm -hmm. and how to develop an identity around that. So I would say that the key challenge is not really to know who are, is listening to your songs, but also to know what they like, what are their topics, what are their interests. Because music is not a, a, a very neutral object. It's a cultural product. And you listen to a musician not necessarily because you only like the sound, but also you like what this musician is representing. So right now, the, the task is, is moving from just making music to marketing your music mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and of course the basis of that is 
data and knowing your audience. Um, well, Urska, mm -hmm. looking at the trends, which yes. you did, but I have to say marvelously in, in State of well, Music. Thank you. <laughs> it's a very interesting reading. Grab your copy at your mm. local newsstand right now. So looking at the trends, was there a common thread that you can really point out? Yes, we can point out a couple of them. And uh, first of all, I would point out that it was all about engagement and participation. This has been important for a long time, but now more than ever. What we've actually noticed is that artists who can actively engage their fan base uh, are more likely to break through, even if they're starting with like a low follower count. Mm -hmm. And this would lead us to, our, to my second point, and this is the rise of digital monetization. An engaged audience is crucial for that. It's a, it's a real necessity. Uh, of course, like we cannot ignore the existing technology that was already here, uh, and also the fact that artists and their teams had to, or were kind of, forced to revisit existing uh, revenue sources and business models. Mm -hmm. We'll kind of go above, uh, above or beyond touring and, um, and streaming. And kind of the third point that I would point out is um, the rise of multilingual artists. And this is particularly uh, noticeable on channels with no... Um, with no... Um, with no... Um, uh, Help me, Lado, <laughs> with no, uh, with no uh, gateway to, like, I with no it. guardians. Right. Yeah. So right. on streaming, on YouTube, uh, something like this. And those, uh, those artists are usually very uh, audience savvy. And one of the tools that it w that they would use to kind of expand this audience would be collabs, for example. Mm -hmm. This is kind of like a quick overview. Wonderful. I mean. Uh, um well, you're welcome for my generous help. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, no problem. But um, well, you've you, you've given us a lot <laughs> to chew on right yes. now. Uh, uh, speaking of audience, audience, uh, let's start here, David. How does an artist know which platform to focus on when it comes to building an audience and, of course, promoting their music? Yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, I think the first thing to recognize is that each platform does a different job like it reaches a different audience and so the first question you have to ask yourself is really like which audience do I want to reach and let's say you're an electronic music artist let's say you're starting out then SoundCloud is the place to start because that's where electronic music artists are that's where the community is that's where people are going in order to find new music to explore new music to find upcoming artists to you know, create selections of music and so that's the place that will find your community get your community and help you on your journey if you're much later in your career and you're ready for mass consumption by mass audiences then of course spotify apple music things like that are really 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 important um, but I think it's much uh, always about starting with which audience do I want to reach? Is it the industry? Is it uh, other DJs? Is it other artists and to build my network? Or is it mainstream audiences? And then finding the platform or the playlists or the blogs or the uh, metaverse strategies that get you to the audience you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but, but, uh, and, but there are, of course, certain points of, in career of a musician when uh, certain transitions from one platform to another are necessary. It's probably wise to make... When is it wise to make uh, a, de a decision to, to do this transition? Well, I think that's exactly why you need something like Vibrate, which is to understand where you're at and where the tipping points are. So I remember back in the day, um, artists like Tiny Temper, for example, when he was starting out, the first marketing strategy was really, really different than the marketing strategy just three months later. The first marketing strategy was very niche. It was all focused on young, super engaged music consumers. That's different marketing and different platforms than three months later, which was about more mainstream, not mainstream, but more mainstream uh, taste-making music uh, audiences then three and six months later, you finally reach true mainstream marketing. Now, that's a pretty fast evolution of a marketing plan. And for right. many artists, that will take years. But it's data, 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 which helps you to understand when you're starting to get traction, where, crucially, amongst which audiences will allow you to make that decision. So measure, measure, measure. Mm -hmm. now, of course, we, 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 have to, um, we have to emphasize that at the core of audience building is, of course, the artist's music. So it is crucial to find ways of um, 
of extending this reach and longevity of, of, of artists' work. Alex, you, you have mentioned previously that streaming can extend the life cycle of songs. Can you tell us uh, a bit more on that topic? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there are several research, and uh, I think the, the report you generated at Vibrate is, is a good illustration of that, that shows that thanks to streaming, what we call a, a Nord song or a back catalog song tend to be um, more older than in the past. So in the music industry, we consider a song as back catalog after 18 months. Research shows that right now, this definition should be reviewed to 36 months. We have many examples of songs that when they have been distributed online, they have not been pop really popular. And then they start to get synced on a Netflix show, or they got a TV appearance, or they are just mentioned in a nice TikTok video. And then the consumption for that song is booming. So now we come with this interesting concept of a slow burn hits. You know, we have a tendency to think that its are its music is is as a short life cycle, but in fact, with streaming, you have a long term asset as a song. And one of the key illustration of that tendency are non fungible tokens, NFTs, that we may uh, talk about in in the uh, monetization part, but right. uh, that's definitely a trend we observe. We have more songs every day, but the song's life is longer. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, encouraging your audience or your fans to engage with with the songs, not just you know within with with the, the artist, just listen to the artist, makes this uh, interesting concept of slow burning, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's not working anymore to say, hey, folks, go and listen to my music. I mean, we live in the in the world of the short attention span mm -hmm. uh, where, uh, you know, 30 seconds may be the maximum attention span of uh, some people. And so we also live in the world of uh, 60 to 80,000 songs a day uploaded on, on Spotify. So uh, the supply of music is absolutely huge absolutely huge. We can't listen all the music available to us. And so that's why you have to be extremely creative. I'm going to take an example of how you can engage your audience. One of them is um, online tutorials. Uh, some big artists today started with explaining how they make music, how they produce music. And so they upload videos on themselves, uh, you know, refining a tune or making a cover song or explaining um, you know, how they built that title and that track. And by the way, for example, on SoundCloud, it's pretty easy to see that and see the comments of users when they like a specific moment of the track. So I think it's, uh, it's one way to engage an audience that is much more original and much more creative than saying, hey, come and listen to my song on a tweet mm -hmm. or on a Facebook page. Well, uh, how important is is the, uh, the how important is that an artist or of course artist's team uh, re realizes that music is just a part of massive creative industry? You know, we're talking we're talking so many opportunities of artists' music in 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 loads of different uh, different uh, products, movies, series, gaming, and so on. How important is that, guys? Uh, Alex, for example. I can start, yeah. Just to give you an idea, um, in terms of size, uh, the video game industry is twice bigger as the, I would say, the video industry, including, uh, you know, video on demand and cinema, and three times bigger than music. Uh, just because the video game industry is digitally uh, native, it, uh, it's 40, 50 years old, um, and it, it no targets almost everybody. It's a really a mainstream uh, uh, media or consumption. Mm -hmm. And so music is, is really a piece of it because uh, we have also a lot of data showing that when people are playing video games, they also listen to music at the same time. Or when they read a book, they listen to music. Or even when they watch a, a Netflix show, they are also using their social media. So there is like... a you, uh, habits that are mixing all of this media all together. And so that's why a musician should really consider the opportunity to be on the on the video game 
to be uh, on a movie, but I mean that's that's a that's a whole complicated task that uh, is challenging. But that also extends to YouTube videos and to uh, all the TikTok phenomenon that you have today. Uh, ma yeah. Maybe maybe I can jump in with one example that I've come across um, just recently. Uh, it's from Euphoria. It's a lot. Of, it's a lot of things that they are because it's all over the internet. And yeah. in one of the recent inter uh, um, uh, series, the in one of the recent episodes, there was a song from Laura Les, who's from uh, One Hundred Gags. And I was just interested what this exposure did to her numbers, and we can look uh, into her data. Right. And we can actually see that the tracks, that the track was Shazam 400,000 times after the episode aired. Aired. Yes. And if we also check uh, what happened to her Spotify, we can see that there was a quite a big sp uh, <laughs> spike. So, yes, th this kind of things actually can make a lot of difference when it goes to uh, exposure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, go ahead, David. Can I add as well? Yeah, I think this is such an important topic. Um, it's really important for artists to realize that although music is absolutely at the heart and the music has to be good enough, it has to be pretty good, uh, that great music is absolutely no predictor of success. One of the examples I really like is um, Rock Around the Clock by Bill Haley and the Comets, which is one of the greatest rock and roll songs, most listened to rock and roll songs of all time. It was a complete dud when it first came out. It was a B-side to a single. No one at the label liked it. No one listened to it. And then it was on a movie. Ha! Ah, suddenly it's a household, uh, household tune. And so the other point being that the academic studies around virality of content show that there's no such thing as virality of content. There's influencers who are basically media channels who like a song and broadcast it. So whether it's a movie or an influencer or a video game or something else, a great song is necessary, but not sufficient. You have to find channels that are gonna broadcast your music to the world. So you have to engage with where people are and that's video games, that's movies, that's TV, that's YouTube, all the other things. We're actually talking about, about rethinking, uh, 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 of course, um, artists re rethinking their mu business models and of course revenue streams uh, earlier. Uh, David, we have seen, and experienced what tipping, uh, subscriptions, NFTs, uh, and many other ways of uh, digital uh, monetization. Which ones have the most potential for artists, in your opinion? Oh, that's a really good question because I think that depends on the artist. And so, my advice for each artist would be number one, and you're going to get sick of me saying this, but number one, like work out who your audience is. Then, You've got to think about the way in which they behave and the um, and the best way to engage them. If your your audience is much older and less digitally savvy, then TV syncs and movie syncs are going to be the best way to get them and perhaps the only way to get them. If your audience is super engaged in up to the minute engagement and actions, then live tipping, live performances, and all those types of routes. If your audience is, as we heard earlier, if they're largely creators themselves, particularly in electronic music, if lots of your consumers are actually making their own music, then classes or interactive sessions that, where you monetize engagement directly with you and your audience, coaching and lessons, then that's awesome. But it isn't going to work for those other two audiences we just talked about. So I think every single avenue has a potential, it has an audience, and it has a type of artist that's right for it. But as an artist, again, critical. Who is your audience? And then where are they? Like, what's the best way to engage them? Well, uh, I'm dangerously opening a whole, a whole area of, uh, of questions and discussion here. But what kind of audience is, is, is the audience that will embrace the hottest topic around the met metaverse? Well, I think there are a bunch of digital natives for whom, uh, let's take my kids, for example, for whom digital goods are actually more exciting than physical goods. I think Christmas in the Boyle household, nobody is interested in opening presents anymore. They're interested in Roblox gift cards and, the, and uh, merchandise for their avatar, particularly rare and exclusive merchandise. 
and uh, no one's interested in our household in going to gigs. The kids would want to go to virtual gigs. That is for them, the reality. That is for them where they hang out, where their friends are and how they socialize. Mm-hmm. So there are, there is a generation for whom digital goods that are scarce, limited edition, tradable, uh, and, all, and all of the gamification that comes with trading and one-upping and collecting, that is totally given. For me, physical, scarce, box set, limited editions, they're all hiding back there, but not for that other generation. So they absolutely exist. Again, though, as an artist, is your audience limited edition, scarce box sets like me, or is your audience young, digitally native um, people for whom digital collections are absolutely uh, as good, if not better than real world physical objects? Uh, Alex, what what do you think? What boxes do artists have to tick before uh, starting uh, monetizing online? What are the things that they have to think about? I think they, they should tick uh, the boxes uh, pretty like the, the image of a pyramid. I think that the basic element of the pyramid is to have um, a good digital presence online. What I mean by that is at least having a website, a landing page, and uh, being uh, fundable and searchable on search engines, because that's what mostly people are going to do. They may shazam you, but then the next step is they may Google you and then try to uh, identify in the next gig you're going to be. And if they cannot find this information, then they're going to be disappointed. Or they may add you to a playlist, but they may forget about you. And so you should really distinguish the the, the career from a song. You know, mm-hmm. uh, your song can be super popular, as David mentioned, on TikTok, but um, it, it does not translate into uh, popularity of or, or your album. So I think the beginning of the of of the pyramid, the first box to tick, is to test their digital presence, uh, and to have a very common identity. Uh, we started the tour today to talk about branding and, and being uh, strategic. I think being strategic in 2022 means having a very good control of your image and your identity on all social media and on your websites and all your communication. For example, there is one I really love to mention here, one band I love, which is called Wolfpack. Uh, as you may know, it's a funk band, and uh, they managed to to book uh, the Madison Square Garden several years ago before the COVID happens. And um, they do not work with a big label, uh, but they do have a very clever strategy in terms of uh, identity and control. One of them, for example, is to create a gimmick uh, when they launch when you launch any video of the band on YouTube. You have a logo and you have an audio signature of the band. I think that's extremely smart mm-hmm. and it's really simple because you can do that. It's just a matter of you know thinking about the pyramid. So, mm-hmm. and on the top of the pyramid is creating scarcity. I think David mentioned that extremely well. Um, digital scarcity is uh, a new concept uh, because for a long period of time, we have been in, in a situation where the supply of music was so huge that, uh, well, the only thing that mattered were uh, were playlists and uh, being uh, on this playlist. I think now what really mattered is to engage with an audience and being able to identify what this audience valued economically. And I think the NFTs is interesting because it's bringing scarcity into um, into the pyramid. But but again, that's the last um, that's the last point of the pyramid. You need to build uh, different layers to achieve that. Mm-hmm. Um, engaged fan base is is one of them is is a must. Urska, yes, wouldn't absolutely. you agree? How how can musicians know if their fan base is engaged enough for for starting uh, this uh, this whole concept of digital monetization? Well, I think that the first thing that they should check is um, let, let me guess data. Yes. That's correct. Okay. <laughs> and this is what this is what we are going to do. Um, I uh, we can look into an example of Pink Panthers, mm-hmm. which is actually one of the biggest breakthroughs of 2021. And she is uh, just as a background, she is known as using TikTok as kind of a focus group. Like she posts like tw- uh, 12 second uh, clips of her tracks and then decides which ones to finish. And like if we go to her uh, her stats. 
First, I would uh, look at the right side of the section. This is our fan base versus engagement section, which summarizes the situation quite nicely. Mm -hmm. uh, we are looking at fan base versus uh, engagement here, and the blue line is uh, engagement. And the red line is a fan base size. And because the engagement is above the fan base size, this is a first uh, really positive sign. On the left, we have fan base growth versus engagement. So the idea here is if your fan base grows, grows the engagement should grow with it. And this is kind of the organic growth. This would, be, uh, this would be another good sign. And in this case, we would see the line grow parallelly. And this is actually exactly what we are looking at here. So like, uh, we can conclude that her fan base is well engaged. Mm -hmm. But does fan base size matter as much as how actively they engaged with your music in terms of digital monetization? No, no. It, well, it, it does a, a little bit, but it's mostly that they are very engaged that, and that they are like willing to participate. It isn't even that important they are locally, like they can be scattered. Mm -hmm. um, but if they are able to participate and engage in what you, and are interested in what you've got to say, this is all that matters. But, but th that means probably means that uh, even the artists which um, much smaller um, audience can actually start dabbling in, in this whole nother um, revenue stream world. Yes, yes, of course, but at the, at the smaller pace, of course. Okay. We've noticed that um, artists who kind of engage in fan-focused uh, fan content, who uh, uh, interact with artists, are on a good path to, mm -hmm. to do so. Mm -hmm. Alex, we've seen a lot of multilingual artists going mainstream. Looking at K-pop, looking at reggaeton, uh, can you see small artists who are not, who are basically non-English speaking, replicate these uh, good practices? Absolutely. Um, again, the music is really a cultural uh, product. It's a reflection of um, you know an opinion and a creation that usually starts extremely locally. An artist from Spain, from Valencia, from Paris is, is expressing his thoughts uh, using lyrics and using uh, musical notes. And then there is this notion of, um, of a strategy. And, and then one of the strategy to conquer new territories, or at least to be more creative in the process, is to start a collaboration. So what we see a lot is, in terms of multilingual artists, is collaboration between a French speaking artist with a Spanish speaking artist or the Spanish speaking artist with an English speaking artist. And, uh, and we see that um, a lot. And I think it's a very smart strategy, but it should be the consequence of a creative project. It shouldn't be, oh, let's conquer uh, Latin America. Let's go to um, Argentina because we sing in, in, in Spanish. So let, let's make a partnership with a Spanish man. I think it has to come organically and um, and come from you know musical collaboration instead of uh, a clear strategy to conquer uh, you know a, a market or a specific uh, speaking language that um, you know people are are more accustomed to. Mm -hmm. D David, what 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 do you think? Is this this is quite encouraging for smaller artists who who do not make music in English? What would you advise them in terms of building an audience? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I think the beauty of the internet is your music can travel anywhere. I think you can engage audiences from anywhere, like straight away. And so number one is spot the places where your music is going. Note, notice where that's where it's working and get people who are excited about your music into some kind of a community, whether you see that as a, a Discord server that you set up for them or a Patreon page or whether it's a Facebook group that you set up or something much more public, like your Instagram comments uh, section, then try and point them somewhere so that you can understand who you've got and you can nurture and engage who you've got. You can learn from them, like we heard about Pink Pantherus and, and TikTok. Um, and that is absolutely your base. If you haven't got to that stage, like if it's not working yet, then go find where they are. Go find other artists who you think... Uh, one step ahead of you go look at who their fans are where they are 
what they say, how they interact, and try your music out with them. Try and engage that audience. Go target an audience and go market to them. Try that instead. But very, the points being, like, be very deliberate about who it is you're reaching and uh, either steal or learn from someone else's audience or your own, but gather them, engage them, learn from them and grow them. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm quoting you right now, but you, uh, you said that uh, you need a coherent audience as opposed to, it does not to be uh, local anymore, which is a g- great summary of what you just said, right? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. So in the old days, if you were before the before the internet, you know, you had to have build an audience and that was geographic, right? It was your local town, it was where you play, where you practice, and where the audience would get to know you. So your audience was defined somewhat by geography. Mm-hmm. That's not a constraint anymore. Mm-hmm. But the power of an audience that is connected in and of themselves is really important. So whether they're connected around a shared love of anime or sake or of football or of rave culture Mm -hmm. like it doesn't matter but find an audience that's coherent in some way and and are excited about your music and yeah that's really important you can't be the unifying force for your audience you have to tap into an audience that's unified in some way by something else and then you can capitalize on that and spread within that audience like much more easily Right, right. Wushka, any uh, any examples uh, proving that hypothesis? Yeah, so we can look at uh, one example of a of a collab that demonstrates that quite nicely. Um, here we have a Belgium singer, the R&B singer called uh, Los and the Acusa, and she sings in French. And we're going to look at her audience map. So here we see that by overall audience, uh, France is her most prominent market, uh, it has 40% of her audience. And the second one is Italy with uh, 24%. But if we sort the audience by Spotify monthly listeners, we can see that actually Italy is her biggest streaming market. Mm-hmm. So the, like, the natural uh, question would be what happened here. So with uh, a little bit of research, we found out that in the beginning of 2021, she has made quite a few appearances in Italy. Uh, and maybe the most prominent a collab with, a, with an Italian hip hopper that got, I think, like 5 million views just on uh, YouTube. And we can also look at what this did to her Spotify performance. So yeah, this was in March, and this is this this is this peak. Mm-hmm. And I think this is quite a good um, example of establishing presence on a new market. Mm-hmm. Well, well, guys, uh, to get more insights on current and, of course, future trends, as I mentioned before, go grab your own copy of the State of Music report. And if you're wondering uh, whether your fan base is engaged enough uh, to go for digital monetization or, or if a multilingual collab sprung new audience, audiences, use data analytics to get this whole concept right. Well, I'm sure uh, our, our uh, panelists will share the links to both of that in, in the chat window. And uh, if you're up for it, guys, uh, let's go to, to Q&A. Um, let me see. So, okay, Todd Nelson asks, what are the top advantages and challenges to live streaming for musicians? David? Well, the top advantage, I would say, is the, let's go with the ability to capture an audience, sign them up, and then own the relationship with them going forwards. But you don't always have that in a real world gig, but that's a major advantage um, of a digital gig. So that would be the top um, advantage. What was the other question? Uh, I think that was, and of course, what are the challenges to live stream, streaming for musicians? Yeah, the challenge is that everybody's tired of sitting and staring at a computer uh, with Zoom calls, right? So you got to do something different. You got to give them a reason why this is a unique moment in time that's worth sitting and staring at a screen for versus the thousands of other things they could stare at a screen. Maybe it's some exclusive performance, super engaging uh, audience interaction where they get to be a part of and influence the show. Uh, maybe it's a collaboration with a, with another artist or something very, very special. But coming up with your creative hook that's true to you musically and your ability to interact digitally with an audience, I think that is the big challenge. Yeah. Do you think this uh, alternative, uh, well, 
alternative way to, to, of course, and revenue streams will be here for artists in the long run, even when the touring and live performances, paychecks return? Oh, I think it's absolutely here to stay. The question is what role it will play. And I think it will be incremental to the existing live set. So no one's going to not do a physical live show in exchange for doing a virtual one. And nobody's going to not attend a real world show in exchange for attending a virtual one. It will just create many more opportunities to engage audiences who otherwise wouldn't have gone to the show. Many more opportunities to play shows on days where you wouldn't have left the house to go travel and do a show. Mm -hmm. And it will create many more opportunities to deliver weird, wonderful and wacky creative experiences to fans without having to rig up a room to do the experience. You can just freestyle and try things out, explore and experiment. Right, right, right. right. Okay. Uh, John Van Halle asks, how does an independent artist identify key audience insights and segments in order to know your audience and, of course, properly set targets? Uh, Alex, any thoughts on that? Sure. <clears throat> well, I think the uh, level number one would be to um, check their metrics uh, from uh, their distributors or from uh, Spotify for Artists. Um, then level number two would be to uh, use platforms such as Vibrate and, um, and try to make more sense of the audience. I think segmentation is key and you have different ways of doing it um, by cities, by territories, by channels, and uh, understanding a little bit better uh, their uh, persona and uh, what kind of um, topics they like and um, when they listen to your music. I think um, an important element to consider is make a distinction between followers and listeners. Uh, these two things are different uh, because a listener can be amassed through a playlist, but it doesn't mean that you can bring these people on the on a, on a live show. Uh, we have many examples of uh, musicians who got millions of, of uh, listeners on Spotify, but they were not able to bring 200 people in a venue. And the reason is because people may discover your music through a playlist, but they may not discover you as an artist. And that's what drives, you know, somebody to pay a ticket or to go to a live streaming concert is because they want to see the whole portfolio of songs, your, your albums, your identity, who you are, and not necessarily the, the great songs you have made uh, and that is shared on, on a playlist or on TikTok. It's a great hook. But it's it's not enough to uh, to bring people on on stage and uh, on the live streaming uh, event. Mm -hmm. Well, John also asks: Are there accessible marketing tech platforms with quality insights available to artists beyond a, a, a demography? Well, demography similar to like Fifty or an uh, Affinio, etc. David, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that the essence of this question is critical, and Alex answered it brilliantly, which is, you know, for example, you can look at dem uh, demographics or uh, geography and segments like that. That's a great start. But to John's point, yeah, going deeper than just demographics and looking at interests and behaviors and attitudes and media consumption and separating audiences on those dimensions is absolutely critical and is a topic I'm very passionate about. So tools like Affinio, which is mentioned in the, in the question, absolutely brilliant at that. Type in the artist's name and it pulls your audience apart into different groups, each of which is coherent in its own way, like I was saying before, different from each other. It allows you to really prioritize which group is it that you think is your core audience and that you're most authentically connected to and then go after. So yeah, Affinio audience is another, others, others are available, but yeah, absolutely critical. Segment however you can, whether it's age and city or whether you get one of these tools like Affinio audience and go deeper, critical. Which guy, I think this one is for you. Mm -hmm. Any prediction for 2022 music's biggest trend? Is there something that will affect all genre? Well, uh, there is something that we haven't mentioned today, and it's, it is connected to the genres, uh, and it's something that we've noticed uh, while studying the breakthrough artists uh, specifically, is that uh, a lot of artists don't like to put their, themselves in like a genre box, but they describe their music as a combination of different genres. It's, this doesn't mean that the genres are going away, it's just that they're focusing more on like creating different moods. 
and mm -hmm. the audience usually respond very well. And um, sometimes, like you just cannot pin it down, like which genre that is. But I think this is really nice because it's actually like it's the it, it's the proof that you're listening to something fresh and new. Mm -hmm. And I like I hope that we will uh, hear a lot of this. <laughs> Wonderful, uh, Tanner. Tanner asks, are there some best practices for building traction and engagement across platforms and generations? Alex. Well, I think um, one way to do this across platforms is to have a, a one link policy. Uh, there are some service providers uh, in music marketing that do that pretty well. Uh, one of them is Linkfire. And, uh, you know, the, the big difficulty that David mentioned at one point is um, the fact that all the platforms that you know work pretty in silos. Uh, yesterday in classroom, I was telling to my students, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. You know that famous quote. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty the same in the digital world. What happens on TikTok may remain on TikTok. What happens on Spotify may remain on Spotify. And so the, the, some, some entrepreneurs in the music industry understood this issue and trying to solve it by providing one link to promote a, a, an album or a song. And the great advantage of that is you can track the click-through rate. So you know how many people are coming from one platform and going to another. And I think that's, that's key because when you spend money as a musician in uh, some advertising online, you don't really know unless you have some of the examples that Urshka has, has shared with you where you, you clearly see a peak, but sometimes it's a, it's a very small uh, spike. And so you, you're pretty disappointed because you think, oh gosh, I, I, I spend a lot of money into this and I, I have only 20% uh, more streams. And so I think that's key. It's a great question because you should have a one, uh, one link one website policy to, to track that. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, Ron asks, uh, how do older artists, interesting question, how do older artists without an established fan base promote themselves? I think this is a great mm -hmm. setup for David, having the boxes of CDs in the back and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That's a really good question. I don't know. I mean, I think... The first, the first question is, when you say older artists, I'm thinking, are you digitally savvy or not? And if you are, then I think that, that opens a whole raft of opportunities. Uh, if you aren't personally digitally savvy, like if you are not uh, willing to sit down and learn one of the platforms at the very least, doesn't have to be TikTok, but could be Instagram or Facebook or something else. If you are not willing to sit down and learn one of those platforms, get good at uh, doing what works on that platform and engaging an audience in that platform, then I think you've got some challenges, which is that your only arsenal of tools are non-digital, physical, real-world tools. Now, it's not to say you can't do music marketing that way, not at all. It's just that you're going to miss out on quite a lot of the audience. So my strong advice is still like pick at least one tool. and It could just be one, Facebook uh, or it being maybe the easiest and just go hard at being very, very good in a way that's authentic and natural to you, but go hard at being very, very good at targeting that audience through that mechanism in the way that they expect to be targeted through that mechanism. Mm -hmm. well, can, I, can I add something on that? Please do, please do, Alex. I think uh, a very nice image you can, uh, you can relate to is Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Harry Potter is growing and getting older and uh, the, uh, the fans of Harry Potter were evolving as a character. I think it's pretty the same for musicians. Uh, your, uh, your audience is uh, growing, getting older with you. And I think a very good mechanism is nostalgia. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all watched, when I see we, I think people uh, that are around my age or David's age, we watched the, the Super Bowl um, halftime show with with a kind of a nostalgia because they were artists we loved when we were teenagers. And uh, I think it's pretty different from my students who are maybe 20 years uh, younger than I am, but it worked perfectly because it, it bridges generation. 
but but again the the nostalgia is a really good thing and if you can if you can build around nostalgia you have something that is much much bigger than any tiktok in the world right right thank you for the answers um uh more questions uh jpw asks what do the analytics say about including music video along with a new song release on platforms that stream video. Alex, any thoughts on that? Well, I think uh, you should include any video, one video per song. I think it's a, it's a, one of the rule I'm, I'm giving to my students in, uh, who are professional musicians is as you want to show a title, a video should be included. And, um, and if you want to create videos that are not necessarily the video clip of the music, you should at least have some promotional videos that people can read. What we know is today on social media, people are not really watching the video, but they are reading the video on their smartphone. And, uh, and usually they are 20, 30 seconds, you know, uh, maximum. So think about, uh, you know, how people are really consuming videos, short videos, and in fact, whether they watch it for a short period of time or they read it for a short period of time. So that's what I would do is not necessarily only make a video clip, but make like a, you know, like a content that anybody can access by reading. Mm -hmm. um, um, Urshka, mm -hmm. um, the mention of TikTok was, okay. was big in a uh, state of music report. Yeah. Uh, and here's an interesting question. Can a small artist still break through on TikTok? I feel a bit late to the party. Hmm. Well, I don't think you are late to the party, but whether you can get your song trending or picked up depends on several different factors. Uh, like we um, did an overview of the genres uh, mm -hmm. that are most successful on TikTok. So that would be pop, Latin, hip hop, even rock or EDM, which is a little bit more popish uh, most of the time. So this is like if you're making music within those genres, you're like on the good path. But also like think about the content that's being like, that's usually trending on TikTok. It's like li uh, lip sync videos, dance challenges, something, something like that. So I would say like if you have an audience on TikTok, if like you are willing to kind of explore the new formats and kind of um, improvise with it, and if you're like willing to also invest some time to establish presence, this could be for you. But also, like, I think that you should have a little bit of fun with it because TikTok is a platform like that celebrates DIY uh, approach, and you, you don't need like big production. Mm -hmm. Like, just have fun with it. Try it. It's a trial and error process always. And also, like, if you're a bit hesitant about it, maybe you should like look of a similar artist to you who, who's already present on TikTok, see what they're doing, what their strategy is, and then like kind of see if this is something you would like to explore. Mm -hmm. And of course, if it works for them. Uh, uh, okay, the next question is from Charles. Are there gatekeepers in the digital space? The social media platforms algorithms are favoring just a few. Alex. Well, definitely the algorithm is uh, the gatekeeper. Uh, they keep changing and uh, it's pretty like uh, discovering um, the recipe of Coca-Cola. It's pretty like a, like a secret. We, we don't really know how it works. We know two things. Uh, one, uh, you need to post a lot to attract the algorithm. So if you, if you release one song every six months, yeah, it's going to be very difficult to be identified by the algorithm. So quantity and uh, and growth is the second factor. So if uh, there is a lot of traction to your songs or to your uh, release, then the algorithm is going to push you to the playlist. Um, but beside this, it's very difficult uh, to um, to really crack that gatekeeper. But for me, that's that's one of them. Then you have all the gatekeeper, which are uh, you know, critics, blogs, articles that can be written about your music, uh, radio station. We tend to forget radio station and airplays, but they are still pretty important for, uh, um, you know, a massification of your audience. Um, and David mentioned about this, you know, segmenting your audience is, is key. And if your audience is pretty older, they are, yeah, airplay is a, is a very, good, very good gatekeeper to, to try to convince. Mm -hmm. 
Um, here's a very straightforward question. My audience is quite small, and I know a lot of them personally. Uh, meet them at shows before or chatted online with them, so I have a very detailed idea of who my audience is. Still find it hard to translate that info into a strategy. Any advice, David? My advice would be go ask them if you know them personally. But David, I think this is uh, this has deeper layers. Uh, uh, this. <laughs> I'm actually not sure it does. I think that's massively underused advice, which is just go talk to them. You know, I've seen major corporations launch research studies that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars instead of just talk to people. Just hey, talk to people. So I think yeah, ask your audience. Like ask them how they found your music. That would be a good question. Ask them what it is about your music or about you that they love is it you is it their relationship or is it the music and what about the music get understand what it is that's that's actually built that connection and then if there's an authentic journey there that you think can replicate hey you found me in this way and you fell in love with this part of my music ask them if they've got other friends who are similar to them um, that they've they've suggested you to and say hmm, did they become a fan did they listen if not why not what was their feedback because knowing why some people who should have liked you actually didn't go on to love you could be really awesome feedback. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think just a heartfelt conversation, understanding the journey and the reasons why a few fans did what they did and uh, ask them about their friends and take it from there. Mm -hmm. um, and let, let, let's have another question. For the, this is the final question. Uh... What would be the best way to get my music featured in a Netflix series, Alex? Well, you you may need um, a sync agent or a music supervisor. So um, there are professionals who work with uh, the movie industry or with uh, in general with the content industry, and what they do is they listen to the brief from from the from the producers of the content. So it could be a a series or a movie, and then they tap into their their uh, knowledge of a song or their network. So one of the key things to do is to try to network with an, one of these sync agents, and uh, you can find some of them in, in your countries. Uh, and this is why usually you're going to attend a music business uh, professional uh, event is because that's usually where you can find them easily. Uh, so before we had a, a conference in France called Midem, where a lot of these people were gathered for a few days. But now the, you have also many of these conferences and, and usually you have one in your country. So try to Google them and get in touch with them because they are the right people to m put your songs in a movie or in a series. Thank you, Alex. Um, let's let's conclude our, our uh, today's webinar um, and let's check our key takeaways today first of them uh, go where your fan base is uh, know what works for your genre which channel can help you break through cater to your fan base we've mentioned that many times uh, create custom content to build a loyal and of course engaged fan base uh, the next one will be create engageable tracks, encourage interaction, let fans be creative with your, with your track, with your music. Think beyond touring and streaming, stay on top of new revenue options, a loyal fan base will support your music with di direct digital monetization, for example tipping. And finally, use data analytics to get it right. Uh, Guys, this brings us to the end of our webinar. I hope you got uh, quite a few answers uh, from our today's guests, uh, answers that will help you create your personal strategy. Uh, thank you all again for tuning in, and of course, thank to my uh, thank you uh, to my. Uh, I want to thank to my lovely guests, David. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure, Alex. Uh, very nice talking to you. Uh, hope to see you guys soon, and Urshka. It has been an yeah. whole thank another you. utter ple pleasure. <laughs> thank yes, you, everybody. Uh, till the next time. Bye.